Okay, Ephesians chapter number 3, and uh, Mark will get those passed out. This is what we do every Wednesday night, just so you know. Ephesians chapter 3, if you will. This has kind of been our launch verses and our text verses as we've been looking at the big picture. And uh, really, as we begin to look at it here and as we think about this and, and in our impact in it and our participation in it, it, it's very vital, it's very important to understand the big picture and what God's doing, why he's doing what he's doing, and how we, you and I, are a part of that doing. And in Ephesians 3 here, verse number 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've been looking at those verses uh, extensively, and we've kind of honed in now on verse number 10. And as Paul makes his uh, declaration of his life and his ministry, I'm going to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and I'm going to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And that's what you and I do as his ambassadors. We preach Christ crucified. According, you know, we preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Then we come over and we make all men see. We put on display. We put into real tangible terms what this unsearchable riches of Christ looks like. That design, that the reason for that is it's going to, its design is to have an impact. One, you're going to have an impact on your community around about you because all men are seeing it. They're seeing what it is to have you be their coworker or their neighbor or their friend and so forth. You know, when I drove school bus, I had... Uh, at one time at our, at our satellite, we had 45 motorcycles, okay? So we had a lot of, I had a lot of buddies because I had one of the older bikes and, you know, we, and anytime somebody would say, hey, we're going to Tortilla Flats. You want to go? Oh, yeah, we're going, man. And this was before they, we repaved Canyon Lake Road, you know, and when you go around the skin and you go around and your front wheel's over here and your back wheel's way back there because of the gravel and the rut. And, and you know why? So you got buddies. You have friends. You go, we'd go to Tortilla Flats, hit them right as they, could you imagine 40 of us hitting Tortilla Flats? Right as they open, we, well, we did it uh, a couple times. But see, the thing is, is you got friends, you get buddies, people who are unsaved, who are not a part of, what, uh, of, of the body, if you will, or who are, and they don't understand how to rightly divide the word or whatnot, but you have an influence, and they get to see that. But also in verse number 10, there's also another impact to the intent that now, now, right now in time, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And that's where we looked last time. We have this impact into the angelic realm, the angels. And we looked at the issues of the angels, and we saw how in time past Israel needed the angels. They needed a guardian angel, if you will. They needed them for protection. And we looked at the verses where God had promised to put a hedge about them and to use the angels. And then they also needed the angels so to, to communicate God's word and his will to them. Gabriel would come. Gabriel, if, if, Michael, the archangel, he's the, he's the five-star general of God's army. That's who he is. He's the main guy. He's the chief of the joint chiefs of staff, if you think about that. Gabriel is the head ambassador. He's the head of the ambassador corps. He's the one that says, thus saith the Lord. Bam, here it is. Michael says, you heard what Gabriel says? Now watch me do it. Boom, and he does it. So Gabriel comes to Daniel, gives him the word. He needs that. You and I, today, we don't need an angel. We have a completely different relationship to the angels. We have been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 
We don't need a guardian angel to protect us. We have the main guy. <laughs> you know, you got angels are the bus, bus, the bellboys down at the valet. Or do you want the CEO of the company? I'll take the CEO, thank you. We also don't need angels to communicate God's word and will to us because we have the completed word of God. But yet we still have a relationship with the angels. And that's what, really what 310 is all about. And because the angels, they need to know something, in, in verse 10, about the manifold wisdom of of God. So they watch us to learn that, to see the manifold wisdom of God. And we looked at verses last time where they will look in on the marriage relationship and see that functioning the way God had ordained it to function. They look in, by the way, remember the two types of angels? Elect angels, saved angels, and fallen angels. Just as you and I interact with the lost world, there they sit in the rafters this morning watching and paying attention and learning. And when we come together here in this room, the angels gather together. They, have, they desired to look into those things, Peter says. So we begin to understand that they're watching us. They have something that they want to learn from you and I, and it has to do with those unsearchable riches of Christ, that manifold wisdom of God. So this morning we're going to lay that in on what the angels need to know, and then we're going to develop that out as we begin to look at, in a bigger picture, what's transpiring. Ultimately, my goal is that when you see the chaos of the world happening, and we see that. We have seen it. You think it was bad the other day. It's going to get worse tomorrow. The question is, is why does it get worse? How, the question is, is how should I respond to that? How should I interact with that? How, what's my relationship to that? And that's really where, where I want to head with it head with us, <laughs> is as we begin to understand that there's things going on behind the picture. Because there's a big picture to grasp. We'll see some details. We won't grasp all the details because I don't know all the details. <laughs> there's some things I go, the verse says it. I believe it. That settles it. I can't explain it. You know, <laughs> So I, that's as far as we're going to go. Some, some not so. We have to have an understanding about the manifold wisdom of God. The angels, they saw some things happen. They don't understand you and I. They don't understand the body of Christ. So they begin to observe us. They watch us do the, the preaching among the Gentiles. They see us proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. They see us make all men see. They see us put it on display. That doctrine. And we, as we teach that doctrine to each other, as we learn that, as we grow, and as we go through that information, the angels then hone in on to it. And ultimately what they're watching you and I do is Galatians 2.20. Hangs on the back wall for a reason. One, so I can quote it right. <laughs> but two, to remind us. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, what? I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I, what, now live. The life that I live right now is designed to put on display the life of Christ. The life that I live now is designed to have His life live out in my life. Now, that doesn't mean He's going to, Cause you to win the Powerball so you never have to work a job again. You know why you have to work? There's great financial discussions in Scripture about why do you work? So you can eat. That's it. And if you're married and you got kids and a family, to then provide for your own. And if you don't and you're single, then you have to eat and then you have the ability to help others. You get the same if you got a family. That's why you work. You don't work to fill up your day. You can fill up your day with, well, college football. 
I did it yesterday, one game after another. That was some bad games. Oh, man. Until Alabama, then it was roll tide, you know. But the thing is, is you, it, you work. Why? Because the book says you want to eat, you better work. God isn't going to rain down manna on your head and feed you. It just isn't going to happen that way. So what do we do? We put that, we take that, we put it on display. The angels go, that's what that verse looks like in their life. Look at that. Wow. So our life is not a small thing. It's, it's, it's not small. It's actually, it's actually big, gigormous, gigantic. Sorry, gormous. What am I? I can't even read my own writing. And I got new glasses. Wednesday night I didn't have them, and I couldn't even read the page because my eyes were that bad. And now I got them, and I can't even read my writing. So you know that what that says, right? So throw them out, right? All right, let's be done. Let's go to Chili's. <laughs> uh, just kidding. For the folks on the Internet, five people just got up. No. <laughs> no, our life is not a small thing, folks. And, and you know, where, where we fit in, the plan and the purpose that God has in life for you individually, for you as a part of the local assembly, is no small thing. And, you know, that's what every person, every man looks for. All, where do we fit in life? Everybody asks that question. Where do I fit? Where do, where, where, where do, where, where, where do I operate? And you know, it's wonderful to know where you really fit and the reality of it. Man struggles. They look for acceptance. They look for validation. They look for different places to, to have purpose and meaning in life. And you know what? They never find it till they come to Christ. And when they come to Christ, John 14, verse 6, that first one up there, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But you know what he says? I am the way, the what? The truth. He, he is the ultimate basis of reality. So if you want to know what reality really is, the only place to find it is in the truth, is in Him. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's fascinating when you think about this. And, and again, we're talking about what the angels need to know. <laughs> they're why, they, You know what? I would imagine they're like, well, where do we fit into this? Do you know Paul says that you and I are going to judge angels? Now you want to start a theological argument, bring that thing up, you know, because judging, everybody got this idea about judge. You know, judgment is a discernment. There's a discernment in that definition. There's also like nine other definitions in the dictionary. But everybody thinks about judge, you're going to, you know, the Lord tells his apostles in, in the gospels, he says, you're going to, you're not going to rule and reign like the Gentiles do. How do the Gentiles do? Do this, do that. Because in his kingdom, it's all about what? Do you remember? Service. What is it for you and I? Same thing. So when you think about judging the angels, you're not going to boss them around. Hey, you. Hey, Michael, get down here and clean this floor. You're not going to do that. He's going to look at you and wipe you out. <laughs> Turkey. But rather, there's a discernment there. There's a working together that's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 30. Again, the Lord, is, uh, he says, I am the way, the what? The truth. Watch verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Wonderful verse here. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. Now, God the Father made the Son this to us. So if I'm in him, where am I? I'm in this list. But what God the Father did, notice how it says it, who of God, who, Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. What's the first thing that he's made unto us in that list? Isn't that fantastic? Not justification, not saying wisdom. Knowing what life is all about. What's the purpose of life? 
What is it all about? You don't find out until you get over here and who you are in Christ. I know what the lost world thinks. Climb the corporate ladder, make the big bucks, you know, have a, have a wife and 2.5 kids and four cars in the garage. No, that's what the world thinks about that. But what's really the purpose in life? There's some wisdom about that. Knowing what life is really all about. Righteous. I love that. And righteousness. Right. Just simply the fact that he's right. <laughs> Being right. You know, he, he, in him we have the source to do what is right. Then he says sanctification. That purpose for which we are created, that issue of being holy, how to, how to find purpose and meaning and validation in our lives. Well, we find it in Christ. Then he says, and redemption. Now, what is redemption? That's the issue of freedom, being set at liberty. You, he has redeemed you from the slave market of sin. He died for you. He, he loved you. He comes along and he says, you, I loved you, you loved me, and I'm going to set you free. I'm going to redeem you. Man, the perp- again, man looks, all we want to know, all, man, seeking life is what's our purpose? What's our purpose? What's our purpose? We don't find it out there. We find it in who we are in Christ. So when we are going to Go back to Ephesians 3. When the angels are honing in on us and paying attention and looking, and it says that we are to make known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, we are to be demonstrating, make it known, that manifold, notice, wisdom of God. The first thing that Christ is to us is what? Wisdom. There's some understanding here. Now, go back to chapter 1. Because when Paul says chapter 3, he's anticipated you have read, at least read, chapter 1. Because 3 comes after 1. Right? New math? Okay. We'll get there. COVID math, they call it now. It's interesting. (laughs) Look at Ephesians 1. Look at verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. Ephesians 1, verse 8. What did I, I hope I said it right. He's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Wisdom. Wherein? See that? Wherein? Wherein what? The end of verse 7. According to the riches of His grace. Wherein? In the riches of His grace. What did He abound to us? He, God the Father, abounded. You know what it is to abound? It's to bust out all over. I've been losing weight. And it's been interesting uh, cleaning the closet. I have at least 200 Harley shirts, (laughs) and they're all big. I'm swimming in them. You know, we're going to make a blanket out of them, or I'm going to decorate a wall or something. I don't know. I'm thinking, man, that's a lot of money. You know what Harley Davidson, HD, you know what that stands for? $100. That's right. Can't get out of the store for less than 100 bucks, And that's the facts. (laughs) So I'm looking at them, and you know what? I'm, I'm sitting there, I put on this one shirt from a store that used to be here, they're gone, and I said, man, I remember when I used to bust this thing out, you know, and now it's some swimming in it, busting out all over, abounding, just this unmeasurable way. What has he abounded toward us in all? Notice, all, all of it. He doesn't leave a piece back and say, if you know the secret code, you got it. He doesn't say that. He says, here, it's all for you. I give it to you all. I give it all to you. Now watch what he, how, where, where it is, verse 9, or how he does it. How, how does he do it? Having made known unto us. What did he do? He revealed something, didn't he? He says, here, I kept a secret. It was hidden in God before the foundation. I said, I'm going to do something over here. And, I, and now I've made it known the mystery of his will. Do you know what that means? That means you don't have to wonder what the will of the Father for your life is. The will of, your, will of the Father for your life, number one, is that all men get saved. 
So when you get saved, trust the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, faith and faith alone in that, guess what you were doing? You didn't realize this, but you're doing the will of the Father. And to come to the knowledge of the truth, that's what we're talking about. Here's the wisdom, that knowledge of that truth, according to his good pleasure, which he pur hath purposed in himself. Notice where this lies. It doesn't lie in whether Alabama wins a football game on Saturday. It doesn't lie in whether you go to church. It doesn't lie in whether you, you, you know, live like grandma told you to live and all this stuff. It doesn't rely, it doesn't lie anywhere in you. It lies where? In him. In his purpose, which he hath purposed in himself. So what's his will? Verse 10. That. That purpose, the intent, here's his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Do you know that that's the only verse that gives that purpose statement right there? Verse 10 is a purpose statement of the eternal purpose of the Godhead right there. Who wrote verse 10? Moses? Abraham? Jonah? Jonah? Job, Enoch, the book of Enoch is big nowadays, you know. No, who wrote that? The Apostle Paul wrote that. The revelation given to the Apostle Paul. The thing that we were reading in chapter 3 that was hid in God before the foundation of the world, but now is revealed. The revelation and what the angels are looking into, are watching, is the same thing you and I are looking into and wanting to know more and more about His eternal purpose. How is it going to work? Man, this dispensation of the fullness of times, what is that all about? Think about that. We, You and I, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. You and I have been made a part of that. So what does this bad boy mean? What does he mean according to the, his pur the purpose in Himself that He's going to gather all these things and He begins to dive into this issue of the ultimate goal of the Godhead. And he says, hey, you, members of the body of Christ, need to understand the eternal purpose of God. So I, Paul, as I write Ephesians, I'm going to lay it all out for you, which he does. So you know how you're going to understand the eternal purpose of God? You have to understand right division. You have to understand dispensational Bible study, don't you? Because this isn't Paul, this isn't Peter. Sorry. This isn't the twelve. This, this is who? Paul. He purposed in himself. I love that. Only God, only the Godhead knew what was coming. Now, if I told you a secret, you couldn't keep it if your life depended on it. Because the moment someone put a gun to your temple, what are you spilling? The secret. The Godhead could keep a secret. Even as the sun hung on Calvary with a spiritual gun pointed to his temple, he kept a secret. He knew something else. He purposed. Now look at verse 10 quickly here. Fullness. I, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Notice that fullness. The, the issue of fullness is the issue of when the end result shows up. Okay? When the reason for what he's doing shows up. So the reason for which God created time. Notice the fullness of times. It's plural. It doesn't say time. But what? Times. We know in chapter 2, Paul talks about a time past, a but now, and a, a, an ages to come. You follow that? Times. You go back in the Old Testament, and you know that God worked certain up to this point, and then he changed, and then he works to this point, and, he, and all of that comes to a 
the reason for which God created all of that to come to pass. The reason for which God created the universe has arrived. And he calls it the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's an expression concerning what God created the universe for. How do you know that? What's the rest of the verse say? He's going to gather all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, on earth, even in him. What's he going to, what's the gathering? What's the all things? See, then now, see how the questions begin? Boom, boom, boom. What's the all things? What's going on? Well, he's going to enlighten us down in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand. In, uh, in, in the, uh, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He's going to begin to talk to us. Come over to Colossians chapter 1. He's going to begin to expound to us, put into our thinking this what's he doing? What's his eternal purpose? He's going to bring all things, all what things? See, that's the question. Is it the trees and the grass? Is it, is, he, is it the Corvette and not the Mustang? What's he pulling? What's he gathering? What's he doing? So now we got to go look at what? Where did Paul just drag us? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, what? Created. First five words of the Bible fix everything. Fixes evolution. Fixes all the science falsely. So, uh, fix... In the beginning, God, what? Created. What did he create? Heaven and earth. Two realms. Right off the bat. But what's in those realms? That's the issue. Colossians 1. Look at verse 16. 1, 16. The book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians are sister books. Ephesians lays in the doctrine. Here it is. Bam, bam. Colossians, a book of correction, comes in and says, okay, you've got bad thinking about this piece of doctrine. Here's the corrective doctrine of how to think about it. You got this. Actually, the problem at Colossae in chapter 2 is that they weren't holding the head, verse 19. They weren't acknowledging the eternal purpose of God. They were, they were still wallowing in their own mire, thinking they were, you know, something. Look at 116 quickly. Man. For by him were all things created, see that all things, that are in heaven and that are in earth. Isn't that similar to what we read in Ephesians 1.10? That he's going to bring all things in heaven and on the earth back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep reading. Visible and invisible. Think about what's visible. Earth. Can you see me? Can you see me now? Ooh, God, Casper. Visible, the earth, invisible, the heavenly realm. Visible, invisible. Whether they be, now watch the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul describe what's in the invisible realm by just using terms that describe, associate with the visible. Why? Because we can then say what? What's here is what's up there. In a couple weeks, we'll talk about the shape of the universe. And in Hebrews, Moses is given a pattern of the true heavenly tabernacle as he lays it out. That's a pattern. Where's the true? There's one out there in the invisible realm. In Daniel, Gabriel comes back to Daniel to give him the information. And he says, I've got a, the king of Persia withstood me. Daniel, or Gabriel's an angel. He came down through the angelic, through down the king's highway, through the angelic realm up there, the heavenly places, and there's a king of Persia that withstood him. Why? Because there's a corresponding, by the way, there was a corresponding king of Persia at the time on the earth. Daniel was dealing with him. Okay? Whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers... So what's a throne, a dominion, a principality, and a power? That's all governmental terms. We understand that. And the reason for this is that the battle that's going to rage from Genesis 1-2, 1, 
to the end of time is whose throne is going to run the universe? Who's going to be in charge? They're all, cre- they, all things were created by him and for him. And by him all things, I- I'm sorry, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Again, what's the all things? Thrones, principalities, powers, dominions, mights, governmental terminology. Verse 18. When God, when God created the universe, he, by the way, notice it, he, it was created by him and what? For him. You go read John 1, and he, he spoke it into existence, but it was for him. For him how? What's he going to do with it? He's going to use it to reconcile it all back to himself. Okay? I can jump ahead a little bit, but that's where he's coming. Verse 18. And he is the head of all, uh, he is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, what things? The governmental structure, he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He has the what? Preeminence. He's the top dog, he's the potentate. He's the cream of the crop. He is it. He's the focus. He's the catch me out, as they like to say. By the way, look at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to, what? Reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Just in case you don't remember what the all things are, talking about that government, what's he going to do one day? He's going to reconcile it all. How does he get that accomplished? By the cross. Are you with me or did I lose you? you got to stay, I hope. If I lose you, raise your hand, shout hallelujah or something. Because you got to pay, because this is important, because we're building for the next one, okay? What's he doing here? When God created the universe, he created it for his purpose. He had a purpose. He had a plan. And he comes along, and that universe out there is going to align up with some things, his wisdom. Come back over there to Ephesians 1. Some things that he's going to accomplish. You and I, chapter Ephesians 1, verse 11, we're made a, we have an inheritance in it. We participate. And he's going to come, and on the earth, he's going to use the nation of Israel through that believing remnant. And the twelve apostles being resurrected into a a literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom that's going to sit on the planet. Man, when we talk about the planet next week, this earth, man, when God created it, you know what the center of God's creation when he originally created the earth was? Jerusalem. That's the center of it, is Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where he said, I'm going to dwell right there. Called it Zion. Bam, right there. That's my dwelling place. There's where I'm going to have my kingdom rest. We think it's Phoenix, Arizona. That's where he's going to be. No, he ain't even going to think about you because you'll be in heavenly places. (laughs) Okay? Then he's going to take the heavenly places and he's going to take you and I, the church, the body of Christ, where he took a Jew and a Gentile, a a bunch of nobodies, and made us somebody because we trusted in his son. And he's going to decorate the sky. We'll look at a verse in Job that says that the heavens are are unclean in his sight. Actually, it's in Isaiah. Unclean in his sight. He's going to go out there and he's going to clean all that out and he's going to decorate the sky with you and I. Why? Because he's the head over what? All things. The dispensation, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He's going to gather up all that governmental realm, that authority. And he's going to, Isaiah says he takes the heavens and he shakes out the inhabitants. Wow. Could you imagine being Isaiah writing that going, what in the world is this? <laughs> okay, I'll write it. <laughs> Because the Spirit says, write it. 
He's going to take the heavens and roll it up like a scroll and just do a one of those little... And you read about it in Revelation 12 when that war in heaven happens and Satan and his angels are cast out and they lose their place. And he restructures the heavens. In Revelation 12 he says, And ye that dwell in the heavens, dwell home, man. We're at home. He said, rejoice. Because the kingdom of our God is there. Kingdom, power, authority is there. He's going to gather it all together in one functioning unit again. And that unit is going to exalt and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to say that He's the one. He's the preeminent one. Because the Father finds all of His joy, all of His delight, all of His pleasure in His Son. And He wants you to do the same. So grasp what's happening. By the way, the fa- if you're in His Son, the Father finds all of His delight, all of His joy. Where? In you. Because you're in His Son. And we are to have, folks, He wants us to have the privilege to love Him the same way He loved the Son. And the angels, they need to understand this. They don't, they grasp the earth because they're going to see it. We're going to look at it here, hopefully. I keep looking at the clock. But they, got, they have no clue about the heavens because it was a mystery of His will. And it wasn't made known until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul, to you and I. Follow that? He says, man, you got to know this. Whew. Okay, you guys looking at me. Go over there, back to Colossians 1. Looking at me like I'm nuttier than a fruitcake. We're going to talk about creation. And as we move there, because God is doing something in creation... And when we talk about creation and what God's doing, then you and I can understand the roles that we are going to play in. There's more information outside of Genesis 1 about creation in the book of Isaiah, the book of Psalms, the book of Job, the book of Proverbs. Job's the oldest book written. First book written was the book of Job, and it contains more information about creation than Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3. Actually, Moses had Job on the table. So did Isaiah when he wrote. Look at Colossians 1, verse 9. I, I, want, I just want you to see something here, about five minutes, hopefully. Maybe ten. And just grasp this and think about this as we, we're going to get ready as we move here. Colossians 1, verse number 9. The Apostle Paul prays, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The Apostle Paul would have you be filled with what? Filled, gripped, under the control of what? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. You see that. The reason for those three things, by the way, gold, silver, precious stones, if you're thinking 1 Corinthians 3, okay? We'll talk about that in the future. When you think about why does Paul pray this, by the way, he prays this all the time for you and I, that we would have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Well, there's a reason for that. Come back to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And it's something that if you just catch this little bit, we'll expound this next time. If you just catch this little bit to think about, Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 19. Proverbs 3, 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. See, do you see the three? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, Proverbs 3, 19. The Lord by, by what? By wisdom, by understanding, by knowledge. 
When God created the universe, come on, you're in Proverbs. Hold on, run over there to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Oh, you got to get Job 38 first. Shoot. Get Job 38 and Proverbs 8. When God created, Job 38, because you got to see this so you understand, you grasp the point here. When God created the universe, when God made earth, when he made man, then he reached over and he made the nation of Israel. And then he reaches over and he makes the church the body of Christ. When he does that, he takes his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, and he puts it into his creation. Colossians, it says, in, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He takes all that he's doing and he, he injects it into creation. He puts it there. Job 38. So, God's purpose in the creation, uh, again, ultimately, it's who's going to run it, who's, whose authority is going to be over it. But I want you to see something this morning. Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Great question. Job's been dealing with his three miserable friends up to this point. By the way, those three friends represent the three philosophy, underlining phil philosophical psychology ideas in the world. They represent them. And he says what? What are they? They're counsel that darkeneth, or I'm sorry, words without knowledge. They darkeneth counsel. He comes in, finally he's going to talk to Job. He says, Job, verse 3, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer, and answer thou me. Now, he's not telling Job, stand there and be like a man. Quit being like a baby, you know. You tell that to your kids. Get up, stand up here, be a, be a man. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, is, okay, Job, it's time to think like a man would think. The created being. Think like a man is going to think. Where, verse 4, was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast not understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations therefore fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? You see all those questions about construction, beams, foundations, cornerstones, all of that information? Job should have had an answer to every one of them. First of all, he wasn't there, but who was? The Creator was. God was. He should have had the answer. And Isaiah, we won't get a... Well, Isaiah 40, we'll get there in just a second. I'll make sure. Make, remind me somebody, okay? <laughs> Where were you? Where are you? Job, do you see what I'm doing? What's going on here, Job? What's happening? Where were you, Job? Who's... But now watch verse 7, because this is my point. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There's the angelic realm. The morning stars, the sons of God. We'll, we'll look at the sons of God issue there. It's, fan, it's fascinating how when God created, he wanted adults in his universe. He didn't want children, so he called them sons. When God said on the first day, let there be light, you know what he did? He went over and he turned the light on so who could watch? The angelic host could watch him lay in the beams. Go, go, to, go to Proverbs 8. Lay in the foundations. Begin to create. So you know what the angels did? They watched him create. They watched him move and do. By the way, he set a cornerstone. That cornerstone, you know what a cornerstone is? It's where all the measurements come off of. That cornerstone is the earth. It's set there. This is where it is. And he measures out the degrees where everything's going to be. Do you know why we're the third rock from the sun? Because God made it that way. Uh, the TV show. <laughs> no. Why? Why are we sit where we sit and we're one degree the right direction or the wrong direction? What happens? We fry or we freeze? Why are we right there? Well, look at Proverbs 8. It's fascinating here, folks. This isn't... You know, mystical, woo, science class. This is the Word of God. Here's the truth. Uh, chapter 8, verse 21. 
uh, verse 22, the Lord possessed me, and, and the me here is wisdom, verse 1, doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her verse. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old, before he created anything, what did he have? He had a thing called wisdom. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the earth, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass His commandments. When He appointed the foundations of the earth, when I, then I was by Him as one brought up with Him, and I was de, a daily His delight, rejoicing always before Him, rejoicing in the habitable part of His earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Whoa, read that again. Woo. You know what wisdom says? I was the blueprint. Before God said, let there be, I was there. And literally what God did is in the Godhead and their counsel before they did anything, they lay out the blueprint. And that blueprint says, we're going to do this. We'll look over next time in Isaiah. And he measures out the mountains. He digs down into the valleys and he measures it and puts it right. And you know what he does? You know why in Genesis 1 it says, and God created this and did this and it, and, he, and it was good? It wasn't good and all right, cool. It was, does it, hey, that matched the blueprint. Right on, baby. All right. It's good that way. It's good. It matched the proof. I did what I did because it's what I wanted to do. And wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are right there. They're on, the, they're on the table. So the angels, as they watch Him create and lay the foundations in and do, you know what they're doing? Wow, look at this! By, by the way, did you catch the, the part there in verse 31 about the habitable parts of the earth? You know what He intended? For it to be inhabited. Man wasn't a second thought. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know, let's create a two-legged dude. <laughs> you know? He had it on the plan. He looked over and he said, okay, this is the day. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're going to decorate the sky. We're going to put the stars out. We're going to put it, everything just right. And the angels saw it. And you know what the morning stars and the sons of God did? They sang. They rejoiced. They were excited. Look at what he's doing. So we're going to look at all that. And then there's a dude over there by the name of Lucifer. And he says, you know what? I want that. And I'm going to be like the Most High, which is defined for us in Genesis as the possessor of heaven and earth. And you know what God said? I'd like to see you try. Let's have a contest. Let's see if my wisdom outbeats your wisdom. And guess what? The battle was on. Well, look at all that. What I want you to grasp this morning is that when God says the angels are watching us and we are exhibiting the manifold wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2, he calls it the hidden wisdom of God. You and I better know about our creation because we're a part of it. When you see stuff going on, we'll talk about the adversary. You know, when he looks over there at Eve, and he says, 
Come here. I got something for you. He doesn't want you to know something because he doesn't want you to be like the gods or be a god. But if you join my crowd, I've got this handy dandy decoder pen. And with the turn the right way, it'll illuminate every, Illuminati, everything for you. But you have to join me. And you know what Eve said? I think I like that idea of having a decoder ring. Where's my box of cereal, you know? And off she goes. And Adam goes, hang on, wait for me. (laughs) Here we go. He didn't say it like that. That's basically what he did, goofball. And you know what the adversary does? He looks at God and he says, I'm against your purpose and plan. You think about the conversion of Adam and Eve, best message ever preached. He got half he got half his audience converted, and that half went out and converted the rest of the population. He got them. Why is this important? Well, there's a battle that's raging. And it's all about whose throne will ultimately rule and reign over the universe. And folks, we need to understand that. We need to know about it. We need to understand our part in it. When he takes us and decorates the heavenly places with us, we're not just up there because we look good. He's, we, we got a plan, we got a purpose, we got a reason. And right now, we're putting on display the whole of the manifold wisdom of God. And the angels sit there and watch us because that's what they need to know about. They need to learn about it. That's why it's important. Okay? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your Son for everything that you've given to us. And we'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In your name we pray, amen.